This is an example of the top kill report, where 191, uh, where there's 191 casualties, 181 people killed um, in Operation Medusa, um, an event occurring about 20 kilometres outside of Kandahar uh, in August 2006. And that event and this report didn't make it into the reportage by The Guardian, Der Spiegel or New York Times, simply because a lot of stuff happened and there wasn't time to understand what happened in this event. A very unusual event with so many people killed, most of them by an AC-130 gunship, but there wasn't time to understand. So we have made all these events easier for everyone to understand because those major media players simply do not have the economic power and time to get through um, material like this. They, we effectively only revealed in those news stories a sample um, of what is occurring. Um, if we look to see why most press uh, uh, in countries that are not full of fear like in the United States, but outside the United States, why most press don't report this sort of information. Um, this is why. This is what the report looks like. At 024Z, CJSOTF requested a medvac for two ANA, etc. So it seems to be unreadable. I, I can read this, but um, any US, any military non-specialist can't read this. But we have written a system here, you see, expand acronyms. And, okay, now you have an understanding of what this is like. It's al almost a, a decryption operation where we go from military acronyms to something that people can read straight away. And in pursuing this particular story, um, which is a, a complex event, uh, and a troubling one, um, we see that it was part of a Canadian-led task force uh, in op Operation Medusa, um, which, if you look at news reports, uh, you look at statements by NATO at the time, killed, where they bragged that this killed about a 1,000 people during that week um, of operations. And researching it, uh, we came to a Canadian military website which um, has recently put up a history of Operation Medusa. It looks like attempting to presage a book that is coming out in September on this operation. And on that website, there's an interview with a Canadian journalist, Graham Smith, who works for the, the Daily Mail. And I think this interview really helps you understand why so little information, quality information, is coming out from embedded reporters. Uh, Graham Smith was embedded uh, in Operation Medusa. And we can see... My name's Graham Smith. I'm a reporter for the Golden Mail. In September 2006, I had one of the most intense experiences of my life. I was uh, on the front lines of something called Operation Medusa. It was a, a big Canadian offensive against the Taliban who were massed outside of Kandahar City. They were, uh, the, the Taliban were digging trenches and um, uh, intimidating locals, and the Canadians decided to sweep in there uh, in, in big numbers uh, and force them out. And uh, I was traveling with uh, a platoon uh, that called themselves the Nomads, uh, these were guys who had been sent all over, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a 50,000 square kilometer box uh, out to the very edges of, of Kandahar City. Um, and so they were moving around all the time. They were never sleeping in the same place twice. Um, and they had even made up these little patches uh, for their uniforms uh, that said nomads on them. Uh, the nomads took me in and they, they sort of made me one of them. Um, I spent uh, what was originally supposed to be just a two or three day embed with them stretched out into two weeks. Um, I didn't have a change of underwear, I didn't have a change of shirt. I remember showering in my clothes, washing first the clothes on my body and then stripping 
the clothes off and, and, and washing my body. And that was just using a bucket as a, as a shower. And uh, it was an intense experience. I, I, uh, I slept in my, in my flak jacket a lot of nights. Um, we were under fire together. You know, we had RPGs whistling in. One time I was standing around behind a troop carrier and uh, we were just sort of relaxing. We were in a, in a, in a down moment. And uh, I think some guys had, had coffee out and uh, were standing around. And I heard a loud clap beside my right ear. It was like someone had snuck up behind me and sort of played a prank by clapping beside my ear. And I turned around and said, hey, that's not really funny. That was kind of loud. And all of the soldiers were lying on the ground because they know what to do when an incoming uh, sniper around comes in. And uh, I didn't because uh, I was <laughs> it was my first time under fire. Uh, so I threw myself to the ground as well. They uh, had sort of made me one of them, and so they gave me a, a little nomad's patch uh, that I attached to my flak jacket. And, uh, you know, as a journalist, you try to avoid drinking the Kool-Aid, but I did feel a sense of belonging with those guys. So I think that confession made to uh, the Canadian military for one of their own internal documentation projects really does sum up why embedded reporting has been so effective uh, in confining the truth. Um, we see people like Graham Smith here not wanting to pick him out in particular merely because he's an example. Um, essentially writers um, entering into an environment where they are amongst men and feel extraordinary to me that um, having to wash the clothes on their body while they're wearing them is some kind of profound experience. Um, and that the support by um, the, the, uh, the mutual defence of the troops with him uh, and his adoption by people who have more physical power than writers normally have um, leads him to a sense of belonging. And of course, once one has a sense of belonging, um, then it is hard to be objective. But it's not just embedded reporters that are the problem. There, there is an active uh, campaign in Afghanistan and other places to distort the truth by buying off journalists and radio stations that are meant to be independent, uh, that have been set up by USAID and claim to be independent. So we can see in this material, in the, in the Afghan war diaries, uh, numerous examples of journalists or radio stations being given PSYOP content. So here's an example where Radio Gazwan was given 12 hours of psychological operations radio content programming and a schedule on which it was be to dictated on and we can see the payment. And in one of these handouts you'll see another. Uh, but there's, there's quite a lot of these occurring in Afghanistan. Um, and unfortunately what this means is that if there is a victory of a sort by uh, ISAF forces, how legitimate will that victory be? If it came about as a result of manipulating the population into an untruthful understanding of what the war was about. So unfortunately, these sorts of operations, which we've also seen in relation to Farsi, uh, news sites uh, run, uh, paid for by the State Department, run by Israel, um, mean that the legitimate dissent within a country, legitimate act, uh, campaigns against uh, the Taliban and their abuses cannot be trusted because you never know who's actually paying for it. Similarly, legitimate uh, dissidents uh, from Iran who start up news sites, um, are their voices to be trusted or not? The Iranian population can't tell because a lot of them are propaganda sites. And we then end up into a, situ into a situation where 
the population has nothing to go on, where everything is some kind of mud, um, where each step is a step into quicksand intellectually because it's not based upon anything that's firm or grounded. And we hope in, in our release of material like this and, and all the other sorts of things we've done over the years where we've provided information that is not opinion and it is not our analysis, although we have done that, but rather it is the raw material produced by the organisations themselves, not for a wider audience, but rather for their own internal audience. Information that was never designed to manipulate you or some other population group or journalists, but rather was designed for the internal constraints, if you like, to manipulate the employees or, the, um, or fit in with, the, with what a hierarchy requests, in, for an example, the United States military. And I see that as a key difference in, in understanding the difference between um, reality and a massage perception of reality. There was criticism of, the, of these war diaries um, by uh, the US administration who tried to disarm them saying that the, this was material that was not high level analysis, that it didn't come out of um, uh, the White House, but rather this was material that was collected by soldiers and intelligence uh, agents on the ground. And that to me is the strength of this archive. It, it is interfacing, it has come about as a direct result of numerous incidents before it has had real time to be massaged or put into politically correct language. And that means that uh, people can produce analysis on their own uh, with these basic facts that uh, the Pentagon and other organisations have uh, used to perform their own analysis. All the statistical reports uh, well, nearly all the statistical reports that are coming out of the Pentagon uh, for this war and coming out of NATO for this war uh, are based upon this archive. So when you see a chart in civilian casualties and that going up or down at the moment it's up, um, that chart is a result of this material. So any sort of different statistical analysis is open uh, to academics uh, and to um, uh, mathematicians and to journalists. So I, I really see this basic um, information from which all other information is derived uh, as the most important uh, ingredient to get into the historical record. Thank you. Very much, uh, Julian. And uh, while we are, I, I open the floor for, for questions, but uh, uh, if I could uh, start by asking you to describe a little bit in, in more in detail this, this ethical dilemma that you are facing with dealing with all this information. Uh, how have you processed, how have you reflected upon, uh, upon handling this in order to achieve the right balance between the right to, to knowledge? on the one hand, and of course the, the risk of, of individuals that can be, that can be exposed. Yeah, so there, there are no easy choices for our organization. Uh, we have different duties to different publics. We have a duty to the people most directly affected by this material, the people of Afghanistan, and the course uh, of this war, which is killing hundreds every week.